Yeah, in today's session, uh, I do want to talk about how supercharged CI, CD, and Data Vault um, ensures data quality and development agility. Uh, but before getting uh, into that, yeah, just a very quick introduction from my side. Also, um, I've been working in the data industry for uh, a decade by now. I, I studied statistics, and um, in the first two years of my career, I actually uh, yeah, operated as a data consultant. Um, and uh, then in 2016, I built my first data company um, where I help live events, um, you know, anything from uh, Ed Sheeran to Justin Bieber live concert to big festivals uh, or the O2 arena in London um, to really analyze um, yeah, their, their users. And at some point, um, one third of all live events in Europe, they were using our software. And yeah, I sold their company end of 2019 to a German Fortune 100 company. And um, at, yeah, at the time I was really obsessed with data. I love, uh, you know, data modeling. I, I use every tool under the sun when I was a consultant, you know, starting from all tricks to writing my own transformation within Python and Stata and R. And so, um, yeah, over the years, like working with data for such a long time, I've actually seen there is a big shift in the world. And this is where I also would like to get started in today's session, which is um, the world of data has changed a lot in the last 10 years. And I want to highlight the key points um, that is forcing us to, um, yeah, to adapt uh, methodologies such as Data Vault you know, 2.0 or CICD. And basically, um, based on that change, there's a new world order that I would like to talk about that requires data teams to just deploy faster and to also maintain rigorous quality and freshness SLA. And that's enabled, yeah, as I've said before, with CICD, that's enabled with specific uh, methodologies like Data Vault um, and can really help your team streamline how to deploy much more effectively and faster. But like, what's the change in the world? And that we've seen right now. And when I look back um, to roughly 10 years ago, when I first started, there weren't that many data sources that you know you want to pull your data from. Usually it's your transactional database, maybe Salesforce, maybe some marketing data. Then you set up like, uh, like one-off pipelines, ad hoc pipelines, whether using like drag and drop tools like Autrix, or you write your own you know, Python code and put it as a grown schedule uh, on Google Cloud to get executed. And then that data is usually being used by very limited downstream uh, usage, um, mostly for decision-making, for BI, but also at the times yeah, I was using it for ML use cases as well. But yeah, um, basically what really changes uh, in the recent years is A, um, yeah, data is just being leveraged, uh, not just for, you know, BI, but also in applications and key automated decision making. And um, we see that data is coming now, not just from a couple of sources, but, you know, from hundreds of sources. We have to centralize that data. We have to set out, you know, complex data pipelines that then really, uh, you know, power your ML, BI, uh, AI, uh, embedded analytics use cases. And the biggest change that we see there is uh, we now ask from data teams to cover a many more data use cases and b to actually um, yeah, meet certain SLAs for data quality and freshness that is as rigorous as yeah, a, a software product would have. So the data product, like the, the, you know, the mark tables um, that are being presented uh, to the end consumer that's being consumed by the end consumer need to meet that rigorous requirement. And uh, because of that, um, the, the only way how data teams can do that um, oh, I sorry, I had this presentation. I don't know why it cut off here, but basically we expect more from data teams and that can only be accomplished by working like software engineers. And so what we see is um, uh, this red line here. If you don't employ um, like best practices that software engineers have already pioneered before, you will never be able to deploy fast and maintain this high rigor of like data quality and freshness SLA. And those best practices, yeah, we call them, you know, data ops. We, you can call them, uh, yeah, and software engineers have pioneered the, the, the DevOps, Dev, uh, DevOps practices. 
And so what, what are like these practices and what happens um, when we don't employ them? And that's kind of the, the graph that, you know, my mental model, like um, at first, if you, you know, don't have Git or CI, CD, um, the complexity is of course lower. And if you only have a couple of use cases, you might be better off just quickly using a tool like Autrix, you know, even drag and drop or a very simple, like write out your code or use DBT for very simple pipelines. Uh, but then over time, if you don't employ the best practices, the complexity just skyrocks. And because of the complexity, you need to pay much more for engineering hours. Like obviously it costs you a lot. Um, and whereby if you uh, yeah, um, use data ops best practices right off the bat, you can battle that complexity to, um, and you can stay agile as a team, deploy very frequently with confidence. You can apply governance uh, and data quality um, and really move to very scalable data infrastructure and processes. And that's why the complexity line really flattens um, in this case. And so you don't pay so much. Uh, the more use cases you want to be able to cover um, yeah, with your data team for, as I've said, AI, ML, BI use cases, but also keep a very high level of uh, uh, data quality and freshness, SLAs, north of now, you know, 99.9%, .9%, right? Like we all know, like for LLMs, uh, we've changed from a world of, um, um, yeah, uh, models first, but like the kind of models, like the, it's a data first LLMs that works um, up to 16% more accurate than when you're trying to just yeah, deploy different models. Um, so the data quality is what matters for your BI use cases, your, your key decision-making, your ML. And so um, that's why th those are the two changes that I really want to talk about today, which is how can you deploy faster and maintain data quality and freshness SLAs? Um, and all of that using CI, CD, all of that using you know, Data Vault. Um, and let's get started with the first use case, right? So it's, it is expected now to, um, for data teams to just deploy faster. And what does that mean, right? And uh, the, the first thing is, um, I'm, you know, we are here at the Data Vault um, uh, meetup. And so um, what I believed, uh, and I'm not gonna, you know, walk you through how Data Vault works, um, or I'm just gonna highlight a couple of key concepts here. I think most of you all know um, this methodology in case you don't, um, yeah, th there are many great workshops uh, coming up as well as already um, announced before. But just to quickly touch base, um, if we use a scalable data modeling methodology like Data Vault, it, it will just you know, help us as a team um, to yeah, address agility and flexibility and like helps us deploy just much faster. Um, because so what is Data Vault? It is a detailed oriented historical tracking and uniquely linked set of normalized tables that support one or more functional areas of business. It's a hybrid approach encompassing the best of breed between third normal form and star schema. The design is flexible, scalable, consistent, and adaptable to the needs of the enterprise. It is a data model that is architected specifically to meet the needs um, of today's enterprise data warehouse data warehouse and this is the formal definition as written by the inventor Dan Lindstedt and this is like a nice picture here on, on the Databricks website but like uh, at, at the end you have these uh, hubs links and satellite um, which are the key elements of, of data vault and with those guardrails um, you can onboard new developers new engineers um, that follow certain gu uh, like uh, yeah guidelines and help them become much more productive and understand um, the setup uh, and help them contribute yeah in ways that really benefit your organization. But as I've said before, I'm not going to go too deep uh, into that because I think uh, we have a more like a unique angle uh, to talk about uh, how you can even deploy faster and ensure data quality with CI/CD. But just to highlight, Data Vault uh, is one way. Um, yeah, to really help you deploy faster. Now, um, another way um, that we've seen is the adoption of Git. And why Git? Um, yeah, and again, we're still uh, at the use case of helping data teams deploy faster with confidence. And when when we introduce Git, right, like Git, uh, I, I assume uh, everybody in this call knows what Git is. Um, so, so I'm just gonna briefly touch base on that. Like Git is being used, yeah, to version control changes, you know, in your configurations, um, and it helps you to collaborate. You can branch off your code, 
Um, yeah, you can merge it together. You can like trace back. You can audit everything that we have committed. Um, it's uh, extremely yeah, efficient because Git uses a pointer system to track commits and branches. And so rollback or merging changes between branches is instantaneous because Git just yeah, sw like swaps the, the pointer. Um, and yeah, you can also recover and roll back very easily. And so, so usually, if you like define and you you know you model your data, you have some uh, like SQL definition, like this very random code here. But then you use that definition and you materialize um, a table inside the data warehouse or a view or materialized views or or whatsoever. So let's stick with like one key elements that um, data teams need to adopt in order to become yeah, as effective as software engineering team is definitely Git. And with the introduction of Git, we will be able to version control our code. But it's very Im important that we don't just version control our code. We have to some sort of ways like version control our data as well, right? And the way the, the world is currently doing that is we like use the same code configuration and we generate like production data set uh, or schema in Snowflake and then we create a staging data set and schema. And also for every feature branch that we generate, we need to create a new data environment. And what these data environments are is at the end of the day, right? Like you are a data team. You want to like make experiments and new code changes to your data pipeline, but you don't you want that to happen in an isolated data environment and not override production right away. Like that's the the, the key uh yeah goal. Um, that we want to accomplish as a team to really branch off and make our experiment and merge that changes back um, very um, yeah, successfully uh, and, and then preferably in an automated manner. And because, it, because we can branch off and work so securely in our isolated branch code uh, environment and data environment, um, yeah, a lot of people can work on the pipeline in parallel to build out more use cases and then can merge their changes back with confidence that it's going to work on the production environment once I merge that data. Now, reality is it's not as simple, you know, as you think it is, because um, right now, the way we are trying to build out those environments is when we create a new code branch, a new like feature branch, what we have to do is we need to create a completely new data set inside our data warehouse by cloning our production data set to that isolated environment. Uh, like, but, but yeah, cloning our production data set. Um, and so of course you can leverage tools like within Snowflake, like zero copy clone or within you know, BigQuery like table clone. And, but effectively you still have to clone your entire uh, production data set to an isolated environment so you don't override that. And when you then make a change in that isolated environment, like you apply a code change and then you materialize that new uh, table inside the data warehouse in that isolated environment, you then need to, of course, change everything that's downstream dependent of that. And then if you want to merge that change to production, you usually open up a pull request and then uh, like the CI CD pipeline would kick in and then you would need to rebuild. Uh, the same uh, table that you have already built in your isolated uh, environment and all of the downstream de dependencies. And then you need to like retest that. And um, then after it passes the test, you then merge it to production. And then you have to rebuild the same tables again and all of the downstream dependencies and retest that, right? And so the, the way, yeah, we're trying to really build out environments, yeah, reminds me of that picture on the right-hand side here. So it it looks like, you know, we end up working uh, in, you work in vFinal, I work in vFinal V2, and it's just like so hard to collaborate and it's not dry, right? It's, it's not the engineering mantra of don't repeat yourself. And so in this case, it's just a simple PowerPoint that's you know 10 or 20 megabytes big uh, to compute and to store. But if we keep recomputing, restoring the same tables over and over again for environments, uh, right? like in this case, those data pipelines are gigabytes or terabytes, and it's just very resource inefficient. So in a nutshell, the way we version control data right now using environments powered by those hacky CI CD scripts is very resource inefficient because it requires you to store and recompute the data over and over again for different environments. It's very time consuming. So your team is not productive in the time while they're waiting for the CI CD pipelines. 
because when you merge your code changes, right, like you need to wait for the recomputation on the staging environment, on the prod environment. When you want to roll back something, you have to roll back the code first, and then you have to recompute the same data and all of the downstream dependencies again. And now let's take a look at how actually Git versions control code, right? The way Git versions control code is just extremely efficient because Git only stores new versions when a file is modified. And so unchanged files, they're not duplicated by Git, right? Like unlike the way we version control data, Git, when it versions control code or AKA files, it does not duplicate anything. And Git uses a pointer system to track commits and branches, like I've said before. So because of that, when you merge changes between branches or roll back something, Git is instantaneous because it just swaps the branch pointer to a different commit. And uh, if we really like think about it, um, the efficiency of Git is, or like without Git, the entire open source uh, software movement wouldn't exist. Like we wouldn't have the softwares that we have right now. Our econ economy wouldn't be where it is right now. And now imagine what if we are able to actually version control um, data as effectively as we version control code with Git, right? Like when we, uh, and like the, there are so many use cases that really will help us deploy much faster as a team, not waiting for those endless CI CD pipelines to rebuild these environments. And it would really streamline um, the way, yeah, we as a team stay agile because the version, like you just merge uh, your code, you when you merge your code and your data, it, it, it and it just works, that's going to be a game changer for uh, the way data teams work um, yeah, and deploy together. And that's exactly what Y42 um, yeah, has been working on and has been able to deliver as the first data orchestrator um, that offers foundational version control for both code and data using just Git. So it means if you have, um, you just use Git and you branch off, and when you branch off, you don't just branch off your code, you also branch off your data. And then when you merge your changes, you don't merge your code, you also merge your data. And when you roll back your changes, you don't just roll back um, yeah, your code, but you also roll back your data together, all using just the classic Git commands. And because we are so efficient, like the way Git handles um, files, we're able to um, build out a lot of different asset version um, very effectively. And then we can embed quality gates in these asset versions, such as assertion tests, anomaly detection, or governance, data diffing, unit tests, pull requests, um, or yeah, automated CI health checks. And we can embed that and then we can use our intelligent asset based orchestrator that uh, not just builds the data pipeline, but also determines which of the version passes actually the audit gate and can go live uh, and can be consumed by a downstream asset or by like uh, by a downstream you know AI ML BI tool. And so um, we are yeah, really the only solution that can actively govern both uh, your code changes for environments, but also regularly hourly source updates and prevent bad data from ever going live. Um, I'm gonna talk about that now in the next section. And this is also, yeah, as I've said before, you don't just, uh, the expectations now for data teams is not just to deploy faster. Like you might just have one or two people now in the data team, right? It's not 2021 anymore, but you still have to meet all of these data use cases um, and model your data in a way that it's scalable and that other people can participate, right? You don't just need to deploy it more frequently. You also need to ensure data quality and freshness SLAs. And that's the tricky part. Like we have this problem of bad data, right? Like everybody talks about bad data. And I wanna like zoom back uh, one step and say like, what is bad data? Why does it matter? Where does bad data actually come from? And I, uh, the definition that I always give is bad data is like ungoverned data, like beta, data basically in the wrong hands uh, and malformed data, which does not model the world correctly. It's inaccurate, um, it's incomplete, you know, it's inconsistent or it's out of date. So it's inaccurate, right? Like uh, yeah, wrong data, um, you type in something wrong when you fill out Salesforce. It's, uh, it's inaccurate, it's incomplete, you miss out a last name, it's inconsistent, you might have duplicated emails, uh, so the same person, it's out of date, that person already changed their name, like last name because they got married or changed their email. Um, so that's uh, what we describe as bad data. And of course, you know, the um, 
uh, the, the result of bad data is like productivity issues. Excuse me, has uh, bad data something to say also with um, that it's moralic, not good? Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I mean, it has ethical reasons uh, as well. Um, is that what you're referring to? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so it has, yeah, so societal and ethical impact, uh, right? Like, for example, invalid AI model inputs. Um, yeah, and uh, a lot of issues with bad data um, in general. So, um, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, we just have a bit of time left here. So I'm trying to get over still a big part of that. Um, so uh, let's have the questions uh, at the end, but thanks for, for chiming in here. Um, so the, what we see right now in the world with bad data is the data volume has really increased exponentially in recent years. And our data investment has also increased. We invest so much money now uh, as an organization into data infrastructure. But at the same time, like data incidents and data downtime keeps rising, right? And the financial impact of bad data is being estimated by Gartner to be like around 30 million per organization. So it really adds up to this trillion dollar bad data problem in the entire um, economy. And we also don't believe that the, like data quality tools are the answer to this data quality problem. So when you, you know, set up a new data stack, like you purchase a tool, like a data warehouse, such as Snowflake, BigQuery, or Databricks, then you will need to add you know, an array of tools in order to make use of that uh, uh, yeah, computation layer, uh, computation storage layer. You would need to buy a tool like Fivetran to ingest your source data like from Salesforce, from your transaction database, MySQL, and so on. Then you need to transform that data using a tool like dbt. Then you need to orchestrate that data pipeline using Airflow. And then after you build out your data pipeline, you build on top um, an observability tool um, such as Monte Carlo. And, but Monte Carlo can only prevent issues, like cannot prevent issues from happening. Um, it can only report bad news when yeah, bad news already happened. And so it's a bit you know, weak in our point of view because like, don't take our word for it. This is uh, Monte Carlo's website. It says data breaks, Monte Carlo ensures your team is the first to know, right? And it's, in our point of view, a quite weak value proposition because as a normal, organi like if I'm a normal enterprise, I'm paying for this data stack here, like north of 500,000 a month and uh, excluding the compute and storage costs of the data cloud data warehouse. And so uh, when working with data teams, we have seen that, yeah, 53% uh, of data teams identify data quality as the top priority. 78% of data teams intend to invest in data quality solutions, but we don't believe in this paradigm where problems need to happen in order to be found. And this is um, like, le let's also go back and like think through where does bad data actually come from, right? And so if we have like a classic data pipeline here, um, I'm like this data pipeline sits on top of a data warehouse like Snowflake or BigQuery. And I use um, like I ingest data, first of all, at, at the raw layer, I pull data in from transactional databases, from Shopify and whatsoever. Then we transform that data and that data is being then used uh, by yeah, operation apps downstream, BI, ML, and what's, whatnot. And right, like that's a very basic data pipeline. Now as, let's assume we build out a data pipeline. It works perfectly well. There's no data quality issue. Everything is fine. Now, the first um, place uh, where bad data can happen is actually when I start modifying that data pipeline, right? And the, we need to modify the data pipeline because the world is constantly changing. And our data pipeline is nothing else than us trying to remodel the world. Um, data is nothing than us trying to find patterns in the world. And so because the world is constantly changing, so does our the need for the data pipeline to constantly change and adapt to the business rules of the world. And be, when we make a change in a fully functional data pipeline, that's one major source of uh, bad data because yeah we can easily introduce some logical flaw in here we can you know add or delete a transformation step and and we yeah tend to that and so that's one major source of bad data coming from and people you know we you know make that big problem out of oh bad data like uh, it's so complex but and on a very fundamental level bad data has two sources and this is if everything else stays constant the only other place where bad data can come from is 
uh, at the very source. So when you like use a tool like Fivetran to pull in data from Salesforce, you know, once an hour, suddenly Fivetran appends or upsorts new data into an existing live table. And it is, uh, yeah, it has a duplicated ID or email. And so it's actually, yeah, coming from the source. And yeah, of course, the person who, who is responsible for it in this case is the growth team who is maintaining Salesforce, right? It's not the, the fault of the data team, but to, to like really highlight there are two places where bad data can come from. You make a change in your data pipeline and you um, like new source data arriving throughout your data pipeline. And that's the only two places. And now, currently, the way we handle da like data, um, we handle updates is um, we need to yeah uh, we need to wait for problems to happen first before um, we can find them. As I've said before, so whether you do a code change um, or like an hourly source updates, like these two use cases uh, that that I've shown you before, like whether you do any of them, we uh, tend to write and publish directly inside the live data set. So the example I gave before, I pull data from Salesforce once an hour using Fivetran. Fivetran will just append or upsert new incremental data to my live data set. And if it's uh, bad data, well, it goes live. Like there's nothing you can do about it. And that beta, bad data will cascade downstream throughout your transformation step, throughout your data vault modeling, your star schema, whatever all the way down to your BI, your ML, BI, uh, AI tools. And only if that bad data is li like goes live, then we start auditing that data. We start auditing it using tools like great expectations, DBT tests, anomaly detection like Monte Carlo, and then we resolve that issue. And we don't believe that this is the right approach. And we actually, uh, and um, the, the we, we want to move into the world where we prevent bad data from happening in the first place, so we believe in a new paradigm, similar to yeah, uh, the way Gandalf stands in front of the bar rock and says, bad data, you shall not pass. And this is wh whether it's a pipeline update or a source update, we write that, like we create a new version of that, that data and uh, it's in an offline uh, environment, like we don't deploy it, we audit it there first uh, with again a normal detection data test whatsoever, and only if it passes this audit, it then can go online and publish. And that should happen both for code updates and regular source refreshes. And so, in very technical terms, this is a CD CI problem that we have. So every time we create a new, like whether it's a source update or a code update, we do a continuous deployment. We create a new version, but we don't let that version go live yet. And then the CI pipeline kicks in. Continuous integration is to like test, uh, run, you know, anomaly detection, run uh, assertion tests, run unit tests, whatsoever. And only after it passes, then it gets deployed. So it's actually a CD, CI, CD problem. We need to uh, embark in order to guarantee that bad data never goes live. And um, yeah, this is exactly uh, what Y42, um, as I've said before, uh, up here uh, has been able to deliver because we are able to version control the code and the data so effectively together. And that helps again with um, the, like two fundamental um, changes in the world. One is to help teams deploy much faster and more frequently. And B is to embed quality uh, gates um, and audit gates um, and to determine which version then can really go live and be consumed by downstream assets, uh, AI, BI, and ML tooling. And um, there is going to be a new, uh, um, yeah, th there's going to be this masterclass next week with, yeah, um, with Rob uh, from our side uh, and the Data Vault user group um, to really showcase you how that work, uh, works. But for now, I'm just going to yeah, quickly show you, you know, a couple uh, of concepts even actually live within Y42 for the next uh, five minutes. And I'm already logged in Y42 in here uh, today in the demo org. And you can see that I'm uh, in yeah, the product space. So the way you can imagine spaces is um, within an organization, you know, the sales team, the marketing team, the product team, they would all have their own dedicated spaces to build out the data pipelines. And this product space here is connected to a data warehouse like Google BigQuery or Snowflake, uh, Git repo like GitHub or GitLab, and the storage like Google Cloud Storage, you know, S3 and Azure Blob Storage. Um, for today's uh, demo, I've already set up a very simple data pipeline. Um, 
it's, uh, yeah, I pull in data from a Google Sheets, but Y42 has hundreds of pre-built connectors. Then I use dbt SQL to transform that data. Um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's not a data vault 2.0. Uh, it's because it's just a very simple example. I just, yeah, use uh, classic staging and mart, uh, yeah, um, yeah, data modeling in this case. And um, as you can see, uh, Y42, like in, we are on the main branch right now, like this is uh, data has already been materialized within the data warehouse. So that's actually the data that sits uh, within BigQuery right now. And uh, within Y42, like every single interaction that you do is actually uh, like Git, using Git in the background. So let me show it to you. Like with Y42, you can, you know, at like SQL model, Python, one of our hundreds of you know pre-built co connectors in this case. So um, I'm gonna just show it with you how it works with a simple T sheet. And so I'm gonna set up uh, yeah, a secret. I've already set it up before. And with that secret, I can pull data from a couple like uh, of sheets and I'm gonna do it for the raw customers and raw orders. And what happens here is Y42 generates everything as code. Um, so uh, we built the fastest Git engine in the browser using WebAssembly. So every single thing you do in the UI, it generates code at the end of the, uh, the day. And we need that uh, definition of code in order for our CI CD pipelines to work. And because it's all code, like you can, of course, have all the Git functionalities natively. Um, in here, you can create new branches or whatsoever using just the UI. Or if you're very technical, you can ju yeah, just use the the terminal and it's all uh yeah you can do uh you can code with y42 uh or use um uh yeah the ui so we have a vs code embedded in here as well um so you can just like really code everything instead of yeah, using the ui but that's not what i want to show you i want to show you this you know ci cd magic uh and this version control of code and the data that really can like help the team deploy so much faster and ensure bad data never goes live. So uh, for that, I'm gonna like discard uh, uh, this uh, local code change here. So yeah, you don't see it anymore. So this is like the data pipeline, right? Like, and for today's demo, I'm gonna create a new branch um, and I'm gonna call it demo data vault. And when I create a new branch, I basically create a new, uh, I branch off the code, but I also branch off the data at the same time. So I instantly get all the data available um, on this isolated demo data vault environment. Like I don't need have to clone any data. It's basically a pointer system, uh, similar, exactly like Git internals. And so I work completely in this isolated code and data environment. And when I make a code change in here, such as like I you know delete that one line of code in here. Um, I just delete that one line of code. I preview the data whether it still yeah works or not, and we see okay it works. Uh, I have um, yeah, and so when I push this change like this one line of code where I delete this one filter having payment method and equals coupon, right? Like I just push this change. What happens is Y forty two takes the code like takes this very code here, code definition, and builds this asset on this completely isolated environment, right? And so, in, um, and let's trigger that build, one second. Um, yeah, it's going to uh, trigger the build right now using that new code. Um, it's uh, happening as of right now. Um, yeah, and suddenly we see it's red. And what's happening here is there's one column level test that says, the accepted value um, failed. And I, I can go into like see the failed row and see there's one value called coupon that actually failed the data test. And um, what happened is I set up before that the payment method uh, in here, it can only be um, bank transfer, credit card, and gift card, but it cannot be coupon. And because of our one code change that we, uh, we uh, manage, coupon suddenly appears now in the data um, as yeah, as you can see, like when we preview the data with that new code, we're actually having one more row called coupon, but coupon does not pass the test. And what Y42 does is we automatically roll back to the previous version here where it passes the test and coupon is not live. So it means the data that's being consumed by a downstream asset, like this Python script, right? It won't contain coupon. So we don't even let coupon, you know, go on like go online in this isolated data environment. And when we are trying to make a, um, a pull request uh, to to uh, deploy the changes 
from our um, feature branch to main, um, that will not like, let me just quickly do that. I create now a simple pull request. At this point, usually uh, convention, like conventional tools um, would need to create a CI CD pipeline to rebuild your change asset and all the downstream dependencies on a staging environment, retest it. But in the case of Y42, because we version control the code and the data together, it basically goes instant. So there's a CI health check that tells you instantly, hey, this my payments table, it has a problem and some downstream, like the downstream dependencies of it. Uh, is like depending on this. So please go and fix it first before you can actually merge that change. And this CI check costs yeah, you nothing. It's instant. And so it really streamlines the way um, yeah, uh, you can work with your team to deploy these changes and deploy them, um, yeah, deploy them really confidently. And so uh, in this case, what you see is we stop uh, with our like CI CD approach by building out a new version, audit it first. We stop a bad version from going live. We stop you from merging that bad code from this feature branch into the main branch. And we actually version control code and data together. So if you want to revert you know, the code changes, you would actually revert the data with it together as well. Um, and so, yeah, I just reverted the code. So it means in a split of a second, you will see that yeah, it becomes green again. Uh, and so in the build history, you don't even see that red job. Basically, we version control the time dimension with it as well. And if we were to actually make you know, a valid code change in this case um, and like build out this valid code change in this isolated environment, um, then like, uh, and we you know, push that change um, and we want to merge that code change to main, it would merge the data with it as well and all of its downstream dependencies. So um, yeah, I, I'm not gonna go much deeper into that, but I just wanted to show you yeah, some really uh, conceptual work um, of the presentation. So in a nutshell, what we believe, uh, and to, to summarize it again, the world is changing. Um, the, the use cases uh, for data has exploded in recent years. We need to work like software engineers um, in order to deploy much faster and ensure high data quality for our downstream use cases. And the only way how to do that is um, use a good like uh, methodology to model your data so everybody's well aligned within your data team, such as Data Vault 2.0. Introduce software engineering best practices like Git uh, and build out versions, but don't do it the current way. It's very inefficient and resource intense to like just wait for CI/CD pipelines and you know wait for uh, yeah changes to um, yeah uh, wait for CI/CD pipelines and recompute the same tables over and over again. Um, instead, yeah, of course, I have to you know brand Y42 in this case, but it's really the best solution to streamline your change management uh, that you don't deploy any bad changes and it just cuts down your data warehouse cost by 30 to 60 percent and your waiting time. And then um, also um, don't embed data quality tools on top of your data pipeline, but use them in the CI pipeline and uh, so you can prevent bad data from actually ever going live. Uh, and yes, that's in a nutshell, uh, the presentation and yeah, uh, Y42, uh, one more uh, last sentence. So at the core, uh, Y42 is a declarative asset-based orchestrator. We run the best of breed open source tools such as Airbyte, uh, Python, DBT, and we have the best in class GitOps to help you version control data and code. Um, and yeah, a lot of observability and governance uh, on top of that data catalog, performance analytics whatsoever. Uh, no need to show that uh, all to you, but please, yeah, uh, attend the next uh, master class where, um, yeah, my colleague Rob will go very in depth, uh, yeah, how um, we can build out Data Vault uh, 2.0 with all of these, you know, bells and whistles of CI, CD, uh, and preventing bad data from ever going live. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah, now uh, open for any questions that you have. Mm -hmm.